Good morning. morning. (laughs) Well, kudos to all of you for braving this cold weather and coming out today. Our warm hearts are quite a contrast to the weather. So welcome to this congregation where we seek to foster community, to grow our spirits, to serve others, and to work for justice. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your background, we're glad that you're here, and we hope you feel welcome. Our speaker today is Mr. Jim Harvin. Some of you may know him. Hardest working man at UUFLB is what I call him. Current leader for our worship team which is in charge, of course, of uh, providing all the necessary elements and assistance to create this and every Sunday service throughout the year. And uh, Jim and his wife Nancy have been members since, uh, I think, 1997. Yeah. And that was the last century. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, He's been a past president of the Board of Trustees, I can remember going to board meetings at his house before we had our wonderful fellowship center. And uh, he's also served in a number of, um, a number of other capacities. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. And now let us enter into worship together. It actually did get to zero degrees last night. So, since we're all here together, we can warm each other up with a song from Mark Broussard and a very simple refrain that just says, Come in from the cold. So whenever you hear that, feel free to join in with me like this. Come in from the cold. Come in from the cold. Just like that. Coming from the cold Coming from the cold Coming from the cold Close the door from the hurt that makes you feel alone Time for you to share that coat you wrap around your life Step into my arms, let me hold you close, I want to so Coming from the cold Coming from the cold Coming from the rain 
Take away all the tears you tried to hide in vain. Tell me every fear that keeps you from this world so wide. Leave it all behind. Stand by my side. I'll share with you. Coming from the cold. Coming from the cold. I've been hurt just like you I know how hard it is to give your love away But baby, it's safe and warm All I'm really asking of you is coming from the cold Coming from the cold Coming from the cold. Our opening words this morning are by the Reverend Karen G. Johnson. Do not be alone right now. Gather together. Gathering together grows courage in ourselves and in others who see the numbers swelling. It is a small thing, but right now, it is an important thing. Great sources of wisdom remind us, just because you cannot stem the tide of all hate, it is still right to do the things you can do. These things add up. Your one thing and my one thing, his one thing, their one thing, her one thing. Together, it becomes a big thing. Do not be alone right now. Any liberation, all liberation, is collective liberation. My freedom is bound with yours and yours with mine inextricably. Let us together cast our lots doing this big thing, bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice.
morning. I'd like to invite the children to come on up. I'd like to quickly share a story before the story. So in my adult brain of too many things to keep track of and think about, I didn't think I needed to read the story this morning, but I grabbed some stories before I came because we need them in class later. And I am so glad I grabbed this one because if I had months to plan... This is your favorite book. I'm so excited to read this book. If I had months to think about this story for this day, this is the story I would choose. Have, have you all read it? Do you know this story yet? Okay. You guys might be into it. You guys might be into it. If anybody feels the urge to, like, pump their fist in solidarity with this story, feel free. It is called Click Clack Moo. Cows that type. You did. Farmer Brown has a problem. His cows like to type. All day long he hears click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo. At first he couldn't believe his ears. Click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo. Then he couldn't believe his eyes. There was a note on the barn door. Dear Farmer Brown, the barn is very cold at night. We'd like some electric blankets. Sincerely, the cows. It was bad enough the cows had found the old typewriter in the barn. Now they wanted electric blankets? No way, said Farmer Brown. No electric blankets. So the cows went on strike. They left a note on the barn door. Sorry, we're closed. No milk today. No milk today, cried Farmer Brown. In the background, he heard the cows busy at work. Click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo. The next day, he got another note. Dear Farmer Brown, the hens are cold, too. They'd like electric blankets. Sincerely, the cows. The cows were growing impatient with the farmer. They left a new note on the barn door. Closed. No milk, no eggs. No eggs, cried Farmer Brown. In the background, he heard them. Click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo, clickety, clack, moo. Cows that type, hens on strike. Whoever heard of such a thing? How can I run a farm with no milk and no eggs? Farmer Brown was furious. Farmer Brown got out his own typewriter. Dear cows and hens, there will be no electric blankets. You are cows and hens. I demand milk and eggs. Sincerely, Farmer Brown. Duck was a neutral party, so he brought the ultimatum to the cows. Down the path he goes. The cows held an emergency meeting. All the animals gathered around the barn to snoop, but none of them could understand Moo. All night long, Farmer Brown waited for an answer. Duck knocked on the door early the next morning. He handed Farmer Brown a note. Dear Farmer Brown, 
we will exchange our typewriter for electric blankets. Leave them outside the barn door, and we will send Duck over with the typewriter. Sincerely, the cows. Farmer Brown decided this was a good deal. He left the blankets next to the barn door and waited for Duck to come with the typewriter. Warm cows and hens. The next morning, he got a note. Dear Farmer Brown, the pond is quite boring. We'd like a diving board. Sincerely, the ducks. Click, clack, quack. Click, clack, quack. Clickety, clack, quack. Let's go to class. This is more of a prayer, I take it, but um, if you want to close your eyes and just listen to the words, it's short, and uh, afterwards, uh, Avi will have his interlude. Let there be a quiet time among us. Spirit of life in us and around us, here is our chance once again to live like we wish the world would live. May we find within ourselves the courage to be who we are. May we know when it is time to listen and when it is time to speak. May we trust ourselves to be the ones to find the words that need to be said or to do what needs to be done. May we trust one another and know that there are many ways to go through life. May we know that through that though we cannot change some of what life gives to us, we can choose how we deal with what we are given. We are coming into our power, and together we can make possible justice and love. We are all connected. We depend upon one another more than we know. We are one body and all is one, not separate. That is the great truth that at some point will be realized by all. As he catches the poor old lady's eye And just for fun he says Get a job That's just the way it is Some things will never change yeah, It's just the way it is Oh, but don't you believe them about it before you made the rules and he said son that's just the way it is some things will never 
changing the reading. But first I want to say that's a very good and appropriate song for this reading. This reading is called From the Good Life, Truths That Last in Times of Need by Peter Gomez. For most 20th century Americans, the fictitious character of lawyer Atticus Finch in Harper Lee's Pulitzer Prize winning novel To Kill a Mockingbird is the figure of justice. The novel was made incarnate in the movie version that featured the incorruptible Gregory Peck as lawyer Atticus Finch, and it is Atticus who could easily have settled for peace, but who risks all for justice for the least of those among his townsmen. The question of equality before the law as the prerequisite of true justice challenges the peace. And I would argue that there is no better moral tale in all of modern American literature since Mark Twain's tale of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn that better illustrates the virtue of justice and the attainment of genuine peace. To enjoy the rights and benefits of peace, one must exercise the duties and responsibilities of justice. The modern temptation is to accept a revision of the duties of the golden rule, one that might say, do unto others before they do unto you, which to many might seem an appropriate accommodation to reality. The moral life says this may accomplish a temporary satisfaction and even the illusion of peace. Real and genuine peace, however, and not simply the absence of visible conflict, requires the priority of justice the intentional decision to do what is right towards God and one's neighbor.
I had in the uh, put into the service description a month ago um, that this would also be somewhat of a poetry service. It's not really like the way we used to have it. Um, we would gather in a very small group, and everybody would bring three or four books and pull out their favorite poems and read them. But uh, we're not doing that this year because um, normally we do it on the New Year's Eve service. But I did want to bring a couple, uh, talk, have a couple poems that I would read as kind of an introduction to, to the sermon. The first one's called "A Riddle for the Bystanders" by Barclay Lane. You cannot hide; it will find you. It is not meant to be camouflaged; rather, avoided by those who claim they are innocent. It is not what you have done or what you will do. It is what you have failed to prevent. The next one is called One Another by a guy farmer. A radio show host poses a question about whether we are being taxed too much. One caller says that he works hard for what he's got, and why should he give it to someone else? Another caller says, we're all in it together. Why not help one another? Dramatically divergent worldviews. One lifts all boats, one sinks them. Different outcomes. So January's theme is justice, as you've probably heard from all the prior words and music and... Uh, so this kicks off the whole month of justice. We have Martin Luther King Day. Um, next week we have Emily Quarles uh, speaking, and then on Monday we have the service, and then the following services will also bring in the theme of justice. But today I chose this one out of our Touchdowns resources called Resisting Reasonable Atrocity by David Schwartz. And so I'm reading his sermon, as we always do, so you have to understand this isn't me, I'm going to throw in a few of my own um, comments into it, but uh, I can't claim authorship. A former South African para paramilitary commander looks across his dining room table into the interviewer's camera. He is in his early 60s, overweight, with short gray hair. He, swear he, he wears glasses and a polo shirt. It's late morning, and he explains, we were at war. We believe that if the blacks were organized and they could rise up, that they would rise up. They were trying to get weapons, and they would have used them on us. I had to do what I did to keep the country from descending into chaos. If we didn't get them, they'd be shooting at us for years later. So we found suspects and took care of them. I did what I had to do to keep our country together and protect us. So you realize this is quite a while back, and, and South Africa had um, apartheid at that time. This is madness. He is talking about assassinating kids, a systematic program to find and kill kids, 14, 15 years old, who had committed no crime. But did you hear the reasons? Did you hear that the killings weren't an act of madness or passion or blind hatred? He had reasons to do what he did, hard-headed, straightforward, pragmatic reasons. When I first realized it, a crawling horror seized me because through the assassinations, though the assassinations sickened me, the thought that they could be reasonable terrified me. I can imagine those same words coming from politicians and pundits and editorials here today. And more, coming from my coworkers, my friends, from my own mouth. My editorial. David Schwartz may not have realized how topical this subject is. We are in the midst of atrocities being reasoned with. Think Charlottesville, think Freddie Gray, think Roy Moore, almost winning the election. These are happening now, today. Mr. Schwartz talks of madness. So we may think of this as madness, but really, I think of it as 
humanists. Who knew we could be so flawed? That is the horror of what this commander had to say, that reasonable, well-meaning people could support reasonable, pragmatic assassination or genocide or ethnic cleansing. These acts are not product of demagoguery, political trickery or force. They are the product of bright, reasonable people making bright, reasonable arguments about how to best protect themselves. This, more than anything else, convinces me of the need for critical education that teaches how to recognize and resist the pernicious, common-sense truths that lead us into such calamity. To resist, we need both to develop critical awareness and to trust our own voice. We need to develop the tools to recognize common-sense evil. We need to find a voice to speak out against it. But despite these imperatives, many forces stifle critical awareness. I saw it particularly in my work as a high school history teacher this year. In the last period of the school day on a Tuesday afternoon in November, I was grading quizzes when a parent of one of my students dropped in unexpectedly. Your son's a bright kid, I said, and you can see it when he participates in the conversations. He's sharp, has good questions, good comments. But he's not doing his work, and you can see it in the grades. Yeah, well, said his father, a heavyset man in his 40s. He thinks he's smart. Like when he watches the news with me, he's always asking me these questions. And I just want to say, shut up. They'll tell you in a minute. But he thinks he's smarter than them. The father's retort to his son was a direct opposite of what I try to teach in class. I tell my students, ask questions, investigate, challenge sources, talk with your peers if you don't agree with something. But the message he got at home was, sit down and shut up. That view assumes power and knowledge are the exclusive domain of authorities. Politicians and pundits have it, but not us. It presupposes that the world is fixed and unchanging, out of our hands, and that things are fine the way they are now. My comment, do you know folks like this that prefer to let others do their thinking? Do you think that is why we are in the situation we are in today? That a large percentage of our population is willing to go along with a reasonable atrocities because someone on the television of notoriety said so? But we in our churches and communities must ask each other exactly the opposite questions. We must ask, in what ways is our world not as it ought to be? Do you think a situation is just? Why do you believe what you believe? Why don't you think something sounds right? What do we need to know to understand each other more fully? It is these habits of mind we seek to teach in our religious exploration classes, providing a supportive space for the development of the critical uh, reason needed to unmask the logical arguments for oppression. But a trained mind alone will not make a difference. It also takes the courage to speak. Speaking out is hard to do. I don't even mean speeches before thousands. I mean it can be downright difficult in a group of three to speak out and stand firm. It's a skill that takes practice and takes trust in one's own power and agency, the belief that you can do something to offer and you can make a difference. My comment. I admit that this is a flaw of mine. I tend to want to keep the peace, not cause a rift between friends or workmates or even customers. It is a fear that such actions will change my relationship with these people and that it could change my comforts that I now enjoy. This faith in one's voice is slowly built in thousand tiny ways and continually eroded in a thousand ways. I'm thinking of a student I had in one of my ninth grade world history classes. The kids were all doing a mapping exercise getting around the Roman Empire. The room had a low buzz as they flipped through the atlases and talked quietly with each other. Two students were having some trouble with it, and a third student, a young woman, was moving back and forth between the, the other two, showing them where to find the maps in the textbook, 
helping them find Carthage and Alexandria and Rome. I watched them work together, and there was a moment of pause where I almost came over to her and just to say, this is great. You're doing a great job of helping these other folks. I'm impressed. But I hesitated an instant too long, and she turned to me and said, frustrated, will you please be the teacher? That shook me. Was I being the teacher? But on reflection, I realized that the student was socializing me to be a teacher just as much as I was socializing her to be a student. She was an active participant in setting up a classroom where I, as teacher, had the power and knowledge, and she, as a student, was an empty vessel waiting for me to drop the information in. Her idea of what teaching is kept her in a subservient, passive role. It kept her from developing her own agency and trusting her own power. But in this situation, I too did not speak, did not in the moment applaud her leadership and teaching skills. And I wonder, what was it that made me hesitate? Her plea that I be the teacher made me doubt myself for a moment, and I second-guessed what I was doing. Intellectual understanding and critical thinking will make no concrete difference to the world without the moral courage and skills to speak out and stand up. We develop them over time, and the courage comes in part from practice. This church community is such a community of practice. It is an environment where we can speak our minds and be taken seriously. In dialogue, we can learn that we do indeed have something of great value to add to the conversation. And in our democratic process, we can pr uh, practice leadership. My comment, our community Sundays were created for just this purpose. This month, we can utilize that hour to work on our critical thinking, our ability to speak out intelligently, and even to write our opinions to others without fear. And Mr. Kelly and company will, will help lead us in that at the end of the month. But it is hard work. We shouldn't forget, and the strength to pursue it across all the years of our lives must spring from firm spiritual and ethical commitments. I only remember one lecture from the Introduction to Ethics course I took in college. It was one of the very first classes of the semester, and the professor began with an overview of the day's argument. There are certain facts, she said, that place an obligation on us as moral people. We can't just walk by. These facts demand action. The classic example, of course, is a man on roller skates about to be hit by a train. Oncoming trains seem to figure prominently in introductory, introductory ethics courses. The fact that he's about to be pulverized by the oncoming locomotive places a demand on you. Give the guy a shove so he rolls out of the way. I've personally never heard this example, but I suppose it is to show that the littlest of efforts can help others, but it requires action. The fact of the world, the fact of the world carries with it certain obligations for us Unitarian Universalists the religious worldview of Unitarian Universalism says that facts are not valueless. The common vocabulary of principles and purposes make this philosophical orientation clear. The interdependent web of all, existent, of, of all existence of which we are part is not a mere fact. It places an ethical requirement on us. It makes us do actionable things, whether it's recycle or carpool or how we vote for uh, or support sustainable energy policies. Nor is the inherent worth and dignity of every person an abstract fact. It too makes concrete demands on us as individuals that we live our lives in a certain way, that our world be structured not to trample on that worth and dignity. Our religious convictions must flow through our politics, our social interactions and our economic decisions. Our spiritual life is the ever-deepening root that bears fruit in our ever-expanding work for justice. The two depend on each other. Spirituality without work for justice is hypocrisy. And without a spiritual root, our work for justice may burn brightly, but all too briefly. 
UUFOB is here to confirm this conviction on a weekly basis so we don't forget and become complacent. UUFLB is here to provide examples from those within our congregation and to provide teachings from varied sources and various speakers. UUFLB keeps us going in the right direction. But we've traveled far from that sunshine-filled dining room in South Africa and the calm, rational argument for assassination. But the crawling horror of reasonable atrocities is never left far behind. Perhaps you've heard debate recently on merits of torture, and you think about merits of torture. This is all about um, Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo of several years back. Perhaps you heard these good, reasonable, common sense arguments. We must keep an ever vigilant. We must keep ever vigilant against good people with good, rational reasons trying to convince us to do terrible things. It takes work, and that means developing our critical thinking skills. Over dinner and after the Sunday service, in class and in conversation, don't tune out if you disagree. Understand why you disagree and why the other people believe what they said. Cultivate a trust in your own voice. Talk with others. Debate, dialogue, listen, and then listen again. Our task is neither intellectual exercise nor mere activism. It requires that we root ourselves firmly in our deepest moral and spiritual convictions. Therefore, above all, attend diligently to your relationship with the divine, the root which will give you strength for the journey and the courage to speak. Pray, meditate, and sing. Walk in the sun and rest. And now um, I'm actually going to do the Nelson Mandela reading to finish this out. I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way. But I have discovered that's the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom comes respons responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. Thank you.